But that's the question for tomorrow's stream. <laughs> it's 630 AM or 6.20 a.m. I've had a lot of fun streaming for the last 10 hours with you guys, but alas, it is time for bed. <clears throat> well, I'm glad I've inspired you. Keep coming back, I'll inspire you more. I'll come up with all sorts of crazy stuff. But before I leave, I was going to show you all the craziness of the Beam Power Network. So let's get out of here. Yeah, good night, firework, and uh, I'm not going to go quite yet. I got 10 minutes, so I want to just show, give you guys a quick tour of the beam power system since I don't think you've seen it before. Are you familiar with the beam power system, uh, Pixel Fox? Have you seen it in use by anybody else? Okay, well then you're about to get a grand guided tour. And you'll see why this isn't as simple as it looks. It may make flying the craft easy once you get your power grid constructed, but getting it there is a challenge. First off, you have to start with a power plant. The power plant is kind of big. It takes a little bit to load. Plus, it's floating, and physics rendering doesn't like floating things. Just a little big. So this is the Tri Alpha power plant. Tri Alpha consists of one, two, three, four, five. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and twelve. Yeah, 12 beam nuclear, re beam fusion reactors, one tokamak fusion reactor, a thermal power converter, and a fusion power converter, which is using charged particles from the fusion reactor from the tokamak. All these reactors are feeding their power into this um, array on top here. The array is currently putting out 44.083 gigawatts of infrared power, an infrared la a long infrared laser beam. So 44 gigawatts. And it's going to an aperture of a dish that is over 100 meters across in six ways. So a 300 foot by 300 foot by 300 foot by 300 foot, basically a football field across each way. All this is pointing directly up vertically and beaming out in a cone. directly above the station. Now that means the only stuff directly above it technically can use it. Which is why we have this little dude. No, it's not anchored in any way. It's just floating there at zero meters per second.
It's anchored using the fact that this game has no currents. And the fact that it's got a really big broad bottom which makes it unlikely to move in any direction. So this is our power relay satellite short range. Now it's called a short range because it only does long infrared laser beams. Now the reason that it specializes in long infrared is long infrared laser beams are of a, a wavelength that is small enough that it's not absorbed by atmosphere. But there are other wavelengths. There are microwave, x-ray, UV, visible light, many, many ultraviolet. There's, there's the full, the full um, electromagnetic spectrum is actually represented in the color. So you can broadcast in any wavelength you want. Now, wavelength actually determines something called spot size. That's the spot calculation. Now, you'll notice on spot size that the distance to spot, the spot size, by the way, is the size of the receiver. So, if you want to get full power, your spot size has to at least equal one on this size, side or less. So the spot size is equal to the distance to spot. So in what I was doing a calculate on, calculation on earlier, this number here is 127 billion miles, which is the maximum distance between Kerbin and Elu. So the distance to spot times the wavelength, and the wavelength of a hard X-ray, or a far hard X-ray, is 10 to the minus 11th, or 1 times 10 to the minus 11th power. Or, as some in scientific notation, 1 e to the negative 11. So that's the, that's the wavelength of a X-ray. Uh, a X-ray, a uh, long infrared, has a wavelength of 0, 0, 0, 0, 4 zeros, followed by two ones. And that's the wavelength of a long red or a long infrared beam, which is what we're using on these satellites here. So this thing couldn't go to a fraction of a hard, of a far hard X-ray. And then um, it's divided by the aperture diameter of the transmitter. Now, for the X-ray beams, we can only use an X-ray laser, which has an aperture size of only 1.88 meters or roughly five to six feet across. So it's a very, very small laser cannon. But the one we have on the ground is over 100 meters wide. The reason for that is this number is so large that by having a 100 meter aperture, we make the uh, long infrared laser able, able to broadcast further. And the way that I've worked it out is the one on the ground is able to hit a spot size of six at geostation or yeah, six at geostationary orbit. So what you need to do next is after you figure what your spot size need is, you have to build a receiver capable of receiving to that size. So if we go to this antenna here, one of these phased arrays, which can fire in all directions and receive in all directions, it'll tell you that its aperture size, let's see, where is it? We may have to turn on the transmitter to see it. So we'll deactivate the relay temporarily, turns on the transmitter. Ah, here it is. Receiver diameter, 10 meter, 10 meters, so it's 30 feet wide. It's able to easily receive the beam from the ground at full power. And so we turn on the active relay, and now it's able to relay that anywhere we need it. Off in that direction. And this one can do it in that direction. Now there's one thing it can't do. It can't cannot relay it through Kerbin. It, it's get, it gets blocked by Kerbin. So Go back to the map here. That's why we why it has two brothers. One sits over here in the east, and one sits over here in the west. And they form a triangle around Kerbin, each one of them beaming the power around in a circle. So what happens is the power comes up from Tri-Alpha, hits the first relay, and then if its power is needed on this side of Kerbin, it bounces here and then goes down. Or it bounces here and goes down. Whichever route is shortest. Now, the final target, the aperture size on the final target determines how much of that power it receives because the relays 
simply relay the beam. So your distance becomes the factor in determining how much power do you receive on the other end and how big is your receiver uh, at the final point of reception. Now the fun part is that's just the tip of the power relay system. That's just local space. On top of these I have the Death Star, which I just put in orbit tonight. The Death Star sits in the polar orbit. And it receives about 2 gigawatts of power from the overall relay system wherever it's stationed in orbit. And using a mod called Persistent Rotation, I have set it relative to Ouroboros Station at EVE. Now what's happening is that this receiver right here is receiving all the infrared power and converting it into a uh, level of usage that the um, cannon can use, the X-ray cannon. And that allows the X-ray to fire a beam to wall power of 353 megawatts, which is currently being aimed at EVE. Way out at EVE. Now, due to the fact that the wavelength on the X-rays are so short, the beam is very small. But, due to the fact it's so powerful, you only need a receiver that is about one meter across to receive all of it. And that power ends up... All the way over at I really gotta take down more satellites. I got so many old satellites. This may take a second or two to render. This station is huge. So that ends up over here, and we built a special three-way receiver that can receive power from any direction. 
right here. And it is receiving 349 megajoules beamed by the X-ray cannon at Kerbin. And that powers that space station. But wait, that's not all. When I finish the station, I'm going to build another section on this side with a transmitter, which will transmit an infrared, which will take its the power of this receiver, along with the power of these four nuclear reactors, and fire it out an infrared broadcaster for around EVE. And then all the craft around the EVE won't have to rely on the sun for power, even though the, the sun's pretty good here. Uh, they can actually re receive power from the station and very uh, large amounts of it. Now, the reason that you need all this power is the Interstellar mod has Vasimir engines. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what the technology is, but a Vasimir engine basically takes and ionizes things and fire it, fires it out the back of the, of the craft. And in doing so, it generates a very large amount of thrust. The only problem is, is that it needs many, 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 many megawatts of power in order to operate. So yeah, this is the first pole in the main transmission line between Kerbin and Eve. And there's Eve back there. So yeah, it's... It, people sometimes say that Interstellar is EV mode, but you have to do a lot of math and you have to do a lot of very precise orbiting and calculations to get it to work just right. But anyway, that's the beam power grid. And by the way, if you're wondering what the optimal setup for a beam power around a planet is, it is... Oh, come on. That right there. Circles the planet. A to B is the highest point on the planet. And E, C, and D are the altitudes of the satellites needed to clear the highest point on the planet. So if you do the trigonometry, you can find out exactly where you need to place satellites for the shortest orbital period. Although I tend to be a little bit more generous than that. I put them usually almost near the planet's geostationary orbit, if not just a little bit below it. And that's it. You all have a great night. Thanks for watching the stream. I'm going to wrap up now. Let's see if we can find anybody to raid.